recording and I'll hand over to Jerry. Thank you, Alim. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jerry Steinhauer. Um, you're here to find out about Scrum and Kanban and to give you a bit of background on me. Um, I've been using Scrum since before Scrum was invented. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I was using agile approaches in the early 80s. So I've seen it all grow up and I really like what Scrum has become. Um, Scrum stands by itself, it works by itself. And because it's based on lean, a lean background, it, um, it works very effectively when combined with Scrum. That's my start point for this. We'll get through the slides in a, in a few minutes. But Victor, over to you. Oh, thank you, Jerry. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Victor Fasher. Uh, it's a pleasure to support um, uh, Jerry on this one. I, I spend most of my time these days providing consultancy and training around Prince to Agile, you know, um, and also, you know, providing consultancy on these things. So it's great to be here to support Jerry on this one. Thank you. Okay. Should we go? Yep, you can carry on, Jerry, yes. Okay. Right. So let's get this started. Scrum and Kanban often combine till they work well together. Um, yes, they do, is the opening statement. Yes, they do. Uh, because they're both based on the same background. The lean principles that came out of Toyota in the 50s um, are the underpinnings of Kanban. They're also the underpinnings of Scrum because the Agile movement used that lean approach when they started looking at how to make IT software development more effective. Okay, so yes, they can be combined. However, I'm going back a step. I'm going back a step to what was there before. And there's a, there's a very specific reason for this. Um, so if I just talk you quickly through what we have on screen now. Bottom left, you see BAU, opportunity or need. And fundamental to every development approach is this start point because every development that you undertake every project that you undertake is always based around what you currently have and when you think about scrum when you think about kanban what do they focus on they focus on what you do now and improvements to it so this process <clears throat> is fundamental to all of this in the middle or at the sorry top right hand side you've got vision and that is your goal. That is what you're aiming to achieve. Your end point. Okay. In the middle, you've got the, the core stages of the waterfall approach. And you've got define, design, build, test, deploy, and maintain. The top, top and bottom ones are in, in a different color. That's because they essentially happen once. So define happens before you start your development approach or your project. Maintain happens after you've completed your development approach. This is maintenance of BAU, keeping it going. Okay, so if you can bear this in mind, the next slide is a view of Scrum. Right, um, it's a fairly standard view of Scrum, and I'm going to talk through it briefly. So starting on the left, You've got inputs from end users, okay? customers, team, and other stakeholders. Filtering through that product owner. <clears throat> the product owner being the customer representative that works with the Scrum development team. Sorry, I've got a frog in my throat. <coughs> okay, and you can see underneath the product owner, you have a product backlog. We'll come back to the product backlog in a minute. Okay, so this is the customer side. The team, the team will select from that product backup backlog that the product owner has access to or owns um, a subset which they intend to work on 
in the next development cycle. Right? They'll break that subset down into the tasks required within that development cycle. And then they move into that development cycle. And if I use my mouse, can you see my mouse moving, guys? Because I can. I can, yep. Yeah, so we can see that. So okay. So into this development cycle here. And they're, they're going to go in, they're going to take tasks one at a time, and they're going to work their way through them. Okay. These, this, this sprint area is anything from one to four weeks. Um, and during those one to four weeks, they're going to go through all of the individual elements that you saw on that waterfall diagram. So that definition will have been done. Then you're into design, define, build, test. So all of this happens during this sprint cycle. It's controlled-ish by a scrum master. But scrum master isn't, there's a, there's a common fallacy out there. Scrum master is just another team leader. Not. Scrum master is a servant leader. Big difference. Um, but the scrum master basically controls activities. Um, you see this area here, daily scrum meeting and artifacts. That daily scrum is a daily get together for the entire development team to identify what did we do yesterday? What are we doing today? What's getting in our way? Three key statements. Okay. And then underneath, I, I'm hoping that you are, are not seeing what I'm seeing where I've got four um, four screen bubbles sitting over the, the right hand side. Um, but underneath there, you've got a potentially shippable product. So the end result of this is a product, a subset of the main product, which could potentially be shipped out to um, a live environment. So you get early return on investment. So you get early feedback. OK, not every sprint is always going to de deliver a shippable product. Sometimes you have situations where you have to have the output of two or three sprints before you have something shippable. But the aim is to get something shippable early. Um, and above that, you've got the sprint review and underneath you've got the sprint retrospective. At the end of every sprint, what actually happens is you have a review of what's been delivered. And this is where the stakeholders come in to say, yes, we like what you've done. Um, and the key to this is that, yes, they will say, yes, we like what, this, what, is, what has been done. Why? Because they've been involved all the way through. They've been reviewing things as they've been coming off that production cycle. Uh, it makes it very, diff very difficult for them to turn around at the end and say, no, we don't like it. If they said we like it all the way through. Um, and then the sprint retrospective, that is simply a review of the process. What went well, what went badly. Now, um, one of the big mistakes that's made out there is, is there's a tendency to focus on what went badly so we can fix it. But if you don't review what went well alongside that, you're never gonna focus on what uh, positives you have. You're never gonna build on those positives because you're too busy the, trying, trying to work out how not to have what went badly next time. Okay, so that is the scrum cycle. Now, this diagram, you're probably looking at that and thinking, what the bloody hell is it? Okay, take you back to the previous slide, the slide, sorry, the slide, last slide but one where you had opportunity and need, the BAU side and the vision, still there. And your task is to get from bottom left to top right as quickly and effectively as you can. Okay, That first block here, define, this is where normally senior management get involved and this is where you'll get your, your go ahead. This is what we need to achieve. Then the next blocks, group one, two, three, four, four, five, and it could be any number, and it's not going to be called group one, two, three, and so on. 
but these are your high level objectives. Okay, if we said that your, your um, requirement, the vision, was to have a new house built, those groups might say things like lay foundations, build walls, add floors, add the roof, move in. Okay, these are the high level goals that you need to, you need to meet. <coughs> At this point, you don't need anything more than high level goals. And you've got these high level goals. Once you've got these, how do you get, let me step back, how do you get to these high level goals? The straight answer is you involve the people who are going to be doing the work. One of the keys, as far as I'm concerned with any agile approach, is that you need to have those people who are going to do the work working out how much effort is involved in that work. Get them involved up front. Okay. Then to expand this, you see product backlog is now coming up here, but there's nothing underneath it yet. And what you're going to do, once you've got this roadmap, you go back to those stakeholders, the customer side, and say to them, right, based on these groups, which you've been involved in, in the creation of anyway, what we now need from you is your list of requirements. Your list of requirements is what's going to drive all of this. So you have a look at those, those high level groupings and tell us what you, what you want to see in there. And you're going to get requirements coming in left, right and center. Um, and guess what? They're all going to be must haves. Every requirement, as far as they're concerned, is critical. So you wind up with a list, right? If you now uh, point the team at that list and say to, say to the team, right, what we need from you is an estimation of how much effort is involved in each of those requirements. Once you've got that, you throw it back to the stakeholders. Okay, guys, you've now got your list, your list plus everybody else's list in this extended list, plus the estimate of effort. Now we need from you uh, an understanding of what's critical, what's important, what's pink and fluffy, and what doesn't need to be there at all. There we go, three categories. And for those of you that have ever seen DSDM, you'll recognize those percentages. So this is using Moscow. Must have, should have, could have, won't have. That's what the MSC stands for. Um, and the percentages come direct from DSDM. And they're basically saying your must haves shouldn't exceed 60%. The higher you go, go above 60%, the more this becomes a problem to you. Because one of the principles that Scrum and every, every other Agile approach uses is the change is inevitable. Change is going to happen. So plan for it. And these areas down here, the shoulds and coulds, give you a contingency buffer. Right? Primarily the coulds. And as you start, you work your way through development, you're going to see that, um, let's say, let's pick this one here, the third item down. You've delivered the first two, and all of a sudden the users look at the third and say, oh, hang on a second, in the light of what we've seen already, that third one isn't what we meant. It needs to change. Okay, that's not a problem. We'll change it. But if it requires extra effort, we're going to have to pay for that effort somewhere because key principle of Scrum and the other, other, other Agile approaches, time and cost are fixed. So if you're going to add something in, you need to pay for it in some way. That's where the contingency buffer down here comes in. Okay, so you're going to take something out down at this level. Who takes the decision? the product owner on behalf of the customers. Okay, so the customers are always in control of this process. 
the customers are always going to get the must-haves, their minimum viable product. Because you've given yourself essentially 40% contingency up front. Okay, hopefully that's all made sense. Yeah. Now, in a nutshell, Scrum, an agile process that allows users and developers to focus on delivering the highest business value in the shortest time. Highest business value, we've just talked about it. The minimum viable product, the must-haves. Sorry? I think someone uh, was just off. Uh, right, uh, okay. Just carry on, Jerry. Yeah, the must-haves, the minimum viable product. This is what you guarantee in this development. They will have, as a minimum, the must-haves. Regardless of changes. Now, does that work every time? No, I've known situations where it hasn't. Yeah, but normally that is because of some outside influence. You know, maybe a new government edict that says uh, all projects in this sphere have to have to now comply with these strictures. It allows practitioners to inspect actual working software every week to one month and decide whether to release as is or continue on another program of enhancement. Right. This sprint cycle that we're talking about, um, one of the most effective ways of getting customer feedback is during the Q&A in there, the testing. Because I, I always try to maintain that um, when you're going into test, you've already got developer testing has happened. Developers already, as far as they're concerned, achieved their targets. It then goes into test. You now get system testing, you know, integration testing and, and stuff like that. But you should also have customer side Q&A. Does it meet our, our objectives? Does it meet our needs? Is it fit for purpose as far as we're concerned? Okay, so every item that comes out of that, that um, cycle will already have been effectively signed off if you follow those principles. And that's how you can then decide whether to re release as is or continue. Business sets the priorities. The teams determine themselves the best way to deliver the highest priority features. The team is essentially autonomous. It doesn't want to be told how to do things. It just needs to be told this is what we have to achieve. And they self-organize achieve it All right um, and again going back to the lean roots self-organization self-retrospection okay these are the principles being carried through here um, agile is not scrum scrum is not agile there's a <laughs> there's a, a, a mistaken view out there that Scrum is Agile. Ag you know, when they talk about Agile, they're talking about Scrum. No, Agile uh, is, a, is a set of principles. It's a set of goals to be achieved. It's, it, this is what we're aiming to work towards. Scrum is a way of achieving it. Okay, it's a specific Im implementation of the Agile framework. It follows the Agile Manifesto and interprets its principles into specific processes. Scrum is one of the most popular. I've seen st stats recently that say something like all 90% of all Agile approaches or Agile developments now are using Scrum. It's something of that magnitude now. The Agile Manifesto, a quick reminder, there are 12 principles. Now, I'm not going to cover the principles. <laughs> we haven't got enough time. But what I can cover is the four highlight items here. Okay. Um, and basically, when the manifesto was drawn up, what they stated was that they valued people and inter interactions over processes and tools. What does that mean? It means that the interactions between 
the customers, you know, the stakeholders, the team that's developing everything, those who want the output, they are more important than the processes and tools being used. Doesn't mean the processes and tools aren't important, but the interactions start before you start looking at the processes and tools. You get the interactions right, and then you get to, you can use the processes and tools effectively. It's rather like when you get in your car in the morning, you turn on the sat nav and you start driving. Where's the sat nav going to take you? Probably back to where you started because that was the last point it, it, it recognized because you haven't told it where you want to go. So the interactions are that process by which you can then tell the processes and tools where you want to be taken. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Working software. It's, it's, the, it's the measuring stick for that development. Does, if you replace the word software with product, it works in a lot, in a lot more than just IT arenas. Um, is, is what we're delivering the right thing? Does it do what we want it to do? Then you document that. Um, uh, you know, the, the days of having documentation division are long gone. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Um, I'm sure that a lot of people still understand time and materials contracts where you are tied into delivering a X amount by a set date, otherwise penalties apply or you don't get paid. All right. Um, in an agile environment, that doesn't work. Because if you're, if you're embracing change, there's no guarantee that you are going to reach that point in time and have delivered X. You may have delivered X three quarters of it, plus a bit of A, B, and C. Responding to change over following a plan. Um, plans are great, but plans are meant to be changed. They have to be flexible. Change is the driver for that, that flexibility. You know, we promise to en enact changes. Okay, so there's value in the items on the right, but we value the items on the left more. <clears throat> Potential pitfalls with Scrum. Okay, um, one of the pitfalls is, is not actually a pitfall. It's not a project management framework. It never set out to be one. But for some reason, it seems to have morphed into a pseudo project management framework. There are lots of organizations out there who are trying to use it as a project management framework. There's no PM to start with. You know, it was never designed to be one of those. But if you need it to work in a project management framework, as with the session we had earlier with Victor and myself about Prince2 Agile, there's a project management framework with an Agile front end, a delivery mechanism, often in the form of Scrum. Okay, or you've got DSDM, which is a custom built Agile project management approach. And the, the key for this project management side of Scrum is that as uh, organizations mature into in agile terms they start off with chaos you know it's that group in the corner doing something we're not sure what they're going to deliver but we know they'll deliver it on time okay they they start to learn mm -hmm. that sometimes you have to have an ability to ask questions at a higher level yeah so you need a framework above it you need that escalation path. Prince2 Agile puts the escalation path in place. DSTM puts the escalation path in place. Maturing Agile organizations will put that escalation path into place as well. They will start giving you um, maybe a senior product owner or a sponsor of some kind. And when it comes to making decisions about critical elements of your of your delivery it's often the case that you will go to that person to say look this is what we need to do are you on board with this 
Mm. <clears throat> okay. Rome often needs a change of culture to embrace it. Change of culture, senior management. One of the things that Scrum has real problems with, and this applies to most agile approaches as well, <clears throat> is getting senior management buy-in. <coughs> Why? Because they need the customer to be involved throughout. You want the customer making those decisions about what do we drop to enact this change, enable this change. You don't want the team to be guessing. You want to get it from the horse's mouth. So you go back to the customer in some manner. Um, but that is often difficult to achieve because you're into sort of com company politics. Um, and finally, Scrum's an uneasy fit in, in compliance heavy environments. Um, if you've got a, a kind of environment where you have to comply with all sorts of restrictions, and I'm thinking of things like oil and gas. Um, I've got sort of background with oil and gas and, you know, Shell, although I've never worked for Shell, I've been told by a number of people who've come out of Shell that to get a project off the ground in Shell, you've got something like 1,500 potential stage gates to go through and some of those you have to go through before you can even apply to go to the next lot and say is this project viable yeah scrum doesn't work well in that now the scrum team breakdown very simple you see in the center you've got three item, three elements product owner Scrum Master, Development Team. Okay, unique entities, every Scrum approach has these. The product owner, that is the interface with the business, the customer-centric side. The product owner will be charged with pr providing and creating that product backlog. The Scrum Master is the servant leader for the team. Servant leader, not team manager, okay? facilitate on behalf of the team make sure that the environment is conducive to um, scrum being used protecting the scrum process but also you can see that from scrum master and product owner you have links to the organization the product owner being on the customer side so making sure that the right product is being delivered now the scrum master is on the team side making sure that the organization understands what the team needs in order to be effective so they understand how Agile works, or how Scrum works in this case. And then finally, you have the development team, self-organizing. Yeah. Um, the development team are probably quite intelligent. You don't tend to get too many unintelligent people in a development team. But we often overlook it. We often treat them as just, that's the team that do the work. And that's why earlier on, I was emphasizing, get the team involved in the early processes so that they understand what we're aiming to achieve. They understand the priorities of what we're aiming to achieve. And they've identified how much effort is involved in that product backlog, because when they come up with a, with an estimate of effort for each of those items, guess what? Mentally, they've, commi they've committed to that estimate. When it comes to delivering it, they'll do everything in their power to, to achieve their own targets. Whereas in the traditional sphere, what often happens is they get given a piece of paper, there's your, there's your next goal, get on with that, and you've got until Friday. And the first thing they do is they sit down and work out why they can't do it because they haven't been involved. Finally, an example of a Scrum task board. And after this, Halim, I don't know if you want to break for questions at this point so that we can answer questions about run the Scrum site and then move on to Kanban. Um, yeah, we can. 
Um, so we can. So there's quite a few questions coming in, but just like we did in the earlier session, if I could just use this opportunity to do a snapshot of the people that have attended. So if you are feeling brave enough to turn your cameras on, it would be great if you could do that, please. And just uh, give everyone a wave, especially if you're enjoying this great presentation <laughs> from uh, Jerry. So we're capturing all of those. Um, so really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so great, thanks. So yep, you, you've uh, helped us. So now we'll go on to some of the questions. Uh, okay, yes, let me just finish with this slide then, Ali. Yes. Okay, so here's, here's an example of a Scrum task board. Okay, this is the, 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 the mantra. This is, this is what the team would be displaying so that they, they're totally in, in, in control of what's going on. And just looking at that from left to right, you've got the product backlog, from which you've, you've extracted a subset, which is a sprint backlog. Some of that sprint backlog has been divided down into tasks. Some of it is in progress. Some of it's in peer review. Some of it's in test. Some of it's done. And uh, there's also an item in there in, block, there in blocked. That is something for the, the Scrum Master to be dealing with to make sure that it gets fixed, whatever the, whatever the blockage is. Okay. You can see there on a day-by-day -day basis, because on a daily basis during that stand-up, when the team say, yesterday I was going to do this, today I'm doing this, these are the blockers, that's the information they're working on, and it's updated as they say it. So you're seeing daily progress, daily movement of items across that board. Okay, so throw it to the questions. Okay. Great, thanks, Jerry. And I'm sure some might still come in, um, you know, as we go through those. And um, before I do, um, just to mention, so if any of you want to have more time with Jerry or Victor, as I mentioned on the earlier session, they are both offering their time up for free as mentors. You can reach out to them through the Slack channel, and I'll also share the link to the Slack channel afterwards. Okay, so any questions that don't get fully answered or you just want a bit more time with them you'll still have an opportunity to do so uh, but on to the questions so jerry there were um four questions i think in total which i've kind of grouped together around uh, roles and responsibilities can a scrum you know can a product owner be the scrum master etc cetera, etc cetera. now some of this has already yeah. been answered in the chat so we do have that already covered but let me just ask them here okay and, and I'll, I'll mention all of them because they're kind of all interrelated. So if you just hold on with mm. me for a second. So can a PM be the scrum master um, on top of their PM duties? Okay, so that's one. So can the PM be the scrum master? What is the difference between a team lead and a scrum master? What's the place of an agile coach in this process? We have, uh, you know, the team lead, agile coach, scrum master, project manager, and then finally, um, scrum master stroke servant leader, in that Jerry discussed the need for a framework on top of scrum. Is that where you re reconcile the project manager? Some, someone somewhere needs an overall plan, else how will the team deliver? No responsibility, no accountability. So, you know, you put a slide on this, but they're kind of yeah. all grouped together, right? How do you do the plan? Who's the project manager? Can the project manager be the scrum master? Um, so Jerry, if you could go first, but I'm sure Victor will probably want to comment on his experience. Okay. Um, the, the, the easy answer to this is that there is no standard answer. Um, <laughs> it, this is so organization specific, Yeah. Um, but there are things that you should do and there are things that you shouldn't do. That's right. Um, you know, PM being the scrum master, that's a very difficult bridge to cross or, to, uh, you know, it's, it's not an, you're going to, you're going to be standing there with your legs really wide apart to, to cross that, to cross that particular chasm. Um, you know, the PM, the PM essentially is controlling a project type organization. They're making sure a project is functioning. The scrum master is facilitating on behalf of the team and is coaching the, 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 the wider organization and the team in what it means to be agile. They're not roles that, that sit very well together. Okay. Um, if I throw it at DSDM, for example, which is um, a full 
flavor project agile approach and was written that way even in the, even in dsdm they strongly recommend that the pm and scrum and scrum master role are not combined okay um now what, what was the rest of that question alim uh the i uh... I guess the agile coach in the process and the team leader who are covering and their scrum master servant lead them about the project plan responsibility. Right. Victor, have you, have you answered any of those in the chat? Uh, a, a few. Um, yeah. you want to re and I, I did yeah. say perhaps I could expand on why I indicated that the project manager was scrum master and a very, very small, uh, software, you know, project environment, uh, you can get away with that. But generally speaking, I go along with the answer you give, just to clarify. Yeah. 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 You know, because they would have to embrace servant leadership approach, as you said, bre 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 sort of breaching that chasm, I like the term you used, is going to be based on their experience and their embracing of servant leadership. Absolutely. Yeah. So if they have it's years not. of experience, you know, you know, yeah. in this environment, and small software project, software development project, you can get away with that. Otherwise, best to separate. I yeah. agree. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't come in with a project manager mindset of no. I'm in control. Yeah, correct. You do, you do what I tell you. Yeah. Because, you know, the whole essence of this team is that they are self motivating, yeah. they determine their own destiny. And that's the key thing, right? I think you've touched on it. And it's yeah, about having that team that's self-sufficient, self-motivated, will deliver. They have guidance. Uh, anyway, so let, let yeah, not, you know, absolutely. Of, um, go on about that. But so look, there may be some more questions on this. So we've seen that, you know, there are four or five questions. Um, so there may be people who still have some questions around it, want to get into more detail. If we don't get a chance to go over it again towards the end. And this is where, you know, as I was saying, reach out to Jerry and Victor separately afterwards. And before I go on to a different area of questions, one additional question came in um, in relation to this. And it's to do with the BA role. So someone asked uh, the business analyst then, what's their role in this? <laughs> okay. The reason I'm laughing is because I, I, have a, I have a bit of a maverick view on the business analyst role. Um, you know, DSDM preaches the business analyst role is there as an agile approach. Um, my view is that the business analyst tends to step on too many people's toes. Um, a business analyst in an agile environment, the best thing that a business analyst can be doing in an agile environment is not uh, extracting information from the users and then writing their, their own version of what needs to be done. It's teaching the users how to write effective user stories. So the users are actually writing their own. Therefore, there's no translation being, being undertaken. And the same applies when the business analyst interacts with the development team. So and on that they, note, they, Jerry, if I could interject, because another question is coming. So where you mentioned development team, and as I said, you know, I know this is key for a lot of people, uh, testers. So how yeah. do the Scrum teams interact with the development team testers, et cetera? Could you just address that as well, please? Yeah, okay. Um, testers are integral to the development process. One of the reasons that Agile as a concept came up in the first place was the traditional approach of test happening way downstream near the end of the process. And that's when you find, oh dear, it doesn't work. Okay. Test is an integral part of the Agile process. If you think back to the Scrum board I showed you just, just now, test was part of that cycle. And it's, it's, it's an integral part of the, of the sprint. Okay? If it doesn't happen within the sprint, you're asking for trouble. Okay, um, and the BA, going back to that, yeah, with the development team, the BA needs to be involved with the development team as well. But again, for the development side, the supply side, helping them to define their user stories effectively, rather than being that stumbling block in the middle where you, <laughs> you often get 
uh, no, we can't go ahead yet. I haven't finished analyzing because I'm too busy translating what everyone's telling me. Why do you need it? So uh, let me move on, on. Go on. Uh, Jerry, if yeah. I may, sorry, because I know we could talk about the roles and responsibilities yeah. for a while longer because you've still got more slides you want to cover around Canva yeah. and I'm aware and there's still more questions to go through. So just for that reason, let me move us on. So um, let me see. Um, who takes the responsibility to ensure the groups, the sprints are sensible in order for time cost bound to overall project plan deliverable? So responsibility for the sprints and that they're sensible, achievable, they can be delivered on time, etc. That's the team's responsibility. The team are the ones who are in charge of their own destiny in that respect. Um, you know, the, the team will have estimated the effort involved. So they, when they go into that sprint with that sprint goal and the, that sprint backlog, have already estimated that they can achieve that. Okay. Um, again, it's a collaborative process though, Victor. Yes, it is, it is. The only thing I wonder is if uh, the questionnaire was referring to a project environment, in which case, as you said, the team would decide on sprints and project manager then has to work out how that fits into the overall project plan. Yeah. But the project manager needs to accept that it's gonna be collaboratively done, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, again, let me move on. So um, a key question, um, so I'm just grabbing them. Uh, someone's asked one that I think we could answer quite quickly is, um, is the Scrum a method for project management or building a product? <laughs> right. Um, it's not a method for project management. Standing by itself, it has no project management elements to it. Standing in partnership with something like Prince2 Agile, for example, yes, it can be part of a method for project management, but on its own, it's not. Victor? Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Product delivery is a focus um, within Scrum um, and not uh, project management. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So look, a few more questions. Some of them have been answered in the chat. Um, sorry if I haven't got to your question yet, but um, Jerry does have some slides to cover on uh, Kanban as well. So if we could do that and then uh, do some more questions uh, at the end if time allows. So J Jerry, over to you. Okay. So Kanban, principles of Kanban. And you should now start seeing some similarities between the principles here and what we've talked about in Scrum and the Agile Manifesto. Start with what you do now. What you do now is the driver for everything, isn't it? So you start with what you do now, and the, the aim is to improve the flow, to minimize waste, minimize time wastage and things like that. So you're looking at what you do now. How can we, how can we best do this? How can we make it better? Agree to pursue incremental evolutionary change. It's an ongoing process. It's not a one hit and then we stop. You're continually looking for changes. Uh, respect the current process roles and responsibilities. The current process roles and responsibilities are what has got you to where you are now. They're key to your continued success, but that doesn't mean that they can't be changed. But pursuing incremental evolutionary change. It's not quick fix. It's let's look at this for the long term. And finally, encourage active leadership at all levels. You know, everybody's, everybody's idea is valuable. It may not make the final cut, but it may actually sponsor a discussion that leads to the final cut. So don't disallow other people's views. And the core practices, visualize that workflow. Okay, work out what that workflow is, because by visualizing it and then focusing on that visualization, you can see where your pinch points happen. Okay, limit work in progress, and this one sounds counterintuitive. Um, limiting work in progress. Why would you want to limit work in progress? Well, <laughs> it's quite simple. As human beings, we are not designed to multitask. You know, 
how many of you are <clears throat> able to pat your head and rub your stomach at the same time? Not many of us, <laughs> not without lots of practice. How many of you are able to juggle? Not many of us, not straight off the bat. Okay, when you have multiple tasks on the go, you're constantly switching from one task to another. And that's where mistakes start to happen because you forget things. Manage the flow, okay? Looking at that flow and making sure that flow is a managed process, but that that management is encouraging that change thinking as well. Make process policies explicit. If you don't have process policies, then anything goes. You do need process policies. And where you need them, make them explicit so everybody has the same understanding of them. Um, incorporate feedback loops. In, this, in Scrum, you have feedback at the end of each Scrum cycle. Here in Kanban, you might have feedback every few days. It's whatever works in the environment that you're in. And finally, improve collaboratively. You know, it's not one person's view. It's a discussion to be had, an ongoing discussion. Right. The Kanban board. Okay, this is just an, another example. But if you look at that board, it's incredibly similar to the Scrum board. Why? Because Scrum used Kanban anyway. Scrum picked up the idea from Kanban. So they develop their own boards. And if you go online, if you Google Scrum boards or Kanban boards, you'll find thousands of them. But they're all based on the same thing. They've all got the same basic elements. You have, on the left-hand side, you have the totality of the work that has to be done. And then from there, in reducing sizes, what's currently happening? So you've got what's been prioritized, what's currently in development, what's uh, development split into ongoing and done. So you've got the work that's ongoing in development, work that's already completed. That Y in the middle, that is an item that's completed. It is ready to go into testing, right? But it's sitting in, sitting in done under development because there's currently no capacity in testing for it. And this limiting work in progress says you cannot pull something in until you have capacity. So they're still working. Once one of them becomes free, why will we pull the cross? Okay, and you can see it moves across until you've got at the end done live. Uh, option A is, is now live or, pot or, or potentially ready to go live. Okay, summary of the two or Kanban can be very useful in a scrum environment. The flow based approach aids in the sprint review. In, in a scrum environment, Kanban, as you've seen, the boards are similar, the mindset is largely, largely the same because it's all about process improvement. They might have differences of opinion as to how often that happens, but in general, they're, they're aiming at the same end, end result. Work in progress limits reduce the impact of task switching, as we saw earlier. You know, if you're constantly switching tasks, and this is one of the reasons why um, there's, there's always been this push for having a development team working on one, development at a time, not multiple developments and not part time. Right? You don't want this constant task switching. And Kanban em emphasizes the empirical nature of Scrum. Start with what you know and continually look for improvement. That empirical nature, you start with what you know. Okay. Right. Do they work together? Yes, they do. <laughs> so.
So we're over to the remainder of the questions then, Ali. Yeah, so that was great. So lots of feedback has come in already from various people. Uh, Jerry, Victor, Ian, I know has contributed as well, saying how informative they found the session. So thanks for that. There are a few new questions coming in and I'll pick them up from the chat. But actually, with, with about eight minutes or so to go, what I'd also like to do is just open it up to anyone that wants to verbalize their question or ask a follow-up question on something that's already been asked. So if you do, can you please unmute yourself and ask a question and we can have a discussion around that. And if not, then I'll ask some more questions from the chat. Yes, I have a question. Hi, Gary. Hi. Uh, I also wrote it down. Uh, in the chat, so probably you can skip it. I, I would like if you can go back to the slide where the Kanban board is. Mm -hmm. and yeah. re really quick, uh, I mean, uh, there's a scenario where the user story E, which is uh, in QA testing, it is blocked and uh, we cannot move forward. Uh, does Kanban principle support pulling user story Y into the ongoing lane or does it? advice that all effort should be put in making sure there are no blocking issues in E and proceed only with okay. on E. The answer to your question again lies in the severity and what the block is. If the block is something that can be quickly fixed, then yes, devote resources to fixing it. If it's something that requires um, assistance from outside, for example, then park it and pull Y across. Okay, so it does support. Yeah, it's it, it's flexible. The, the thing about can, both Kanban and Scrum is that they, they are not prescriptive. It does not say that A, follow, uh, a precedes B and B has to follow A. If, if there are reasons for changing that sequence, then change the sequence. Okay. Okay, be All pragmatic right. about it. Victor, have you got anything to add to that? No, not really. No, it's got uh, pragmatism is the name of the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You've got to do what works in a given situation. And uh, as long as the flow is um, managed effectively, that's the bottom line. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, and I do want to see if there's any other questions that people want to ask verbally, but I think it's time to challenge, uh, to try and answer Robin's question. It's a monster of a question <laughs> be in your chat area. So, let's, so that's let's yours, Alim, right? <laughs> this might take up the rest of the session. So um, let, let's go. So I'll read it out, but you know, you'll see it on the screen. So I took over an existing running project about a year ago. I'd been running for a year and a half before that, and the key theme identified was that the team had not spent the time designing the output and upskilling the team before starting. This manifested into a situation where more tasks were being created than being completed as gotchas and unexpected issues arose. I'm fearful of the team entering the same situation. Any hints on how to avoid similar situations? For context, the project was migrating the company's web application to uh, Azure. Okay, so about upskilling the gotchas um, and a situation that he, he or other people might find themselves in. How, how do you avoid that? That one is so, so difficult to answer because <clears throat> it's, it, it is so specific to the politics within the organization and stuff like that. Um, you know, from what the, the question is saying, it was poorly started, that the team weren't aware of what they were going to be working on, um, that the team weren't asked how, it, how to be most effective in producing this, that probably the product backlog itself um, was extrapolated by force rather than freely given. Um, and, you know, it, it could all be to have been avoided, and that's the key. The answer to, to the question is, you're in that mess now. The discussion that should be happening, realistically, is do we continue in the same mess, or do we actually take a pause here and get it straight? Um, and, you know, that's a situation I've been in in, in the past. You, you get to a point where 
following the same path. You know, it's it's the old um, adage about doing the same thing and ex expecting a different result is a definition of insanity. And can I just add, um, if I could just um, ask Victor to cover this, actually, and Victor, I, I know you were about to, because some of this, I guess, uh, came up in your session earlier as well, Victor, around fixing, flexing, the minimum viable product, you know, what you do, what you don't do, scope. Um, so if you could just add to that as well, and we'll see if we can get one more question in. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it, it's a tough one because in, in terms of what, how could he have been avoided? I think Jerry's right. We needed to, there was, is a need to have properly identified the customer, the business and engage them, find out if they even would line up with the way we expect users to participate in an agile environment, starting with the, with the way they elicit the requirements, what exactly are we working on, so that the pro backlog isn't constituted with things that the customer doesn't want or doesn't need. Now, it, and if that's done properly, then the skilling up of the resources needed is the next step. But if we haven't identified the requirements by talking to the right customer, and I use customer in quote because we're within an organization that should know what they want because I'm moving you know, from one product to Azure. So if that's the case, then we should correctly identify that and ownership should be there in place. And if we had identified that and we don't have the skills in house, it may cost more money, maybe outsourcing should have been the solution. So I think it's the initial bit of correctly identifying the customer, who within the business should be telling us what they want at the end of this. But a lot of the time assumptions are made because it's seen as an obvious thing, right? The benefits are obvious, right? We need to move and migrate from the current system to a better one, what could go wrong? And we're seeing a lot could go wrong. So that's how we could have avoided, in terms of moving from, from the current point, it's pretty difficult. It, it, a lot depends on how much money you have available to actually you know, you take a different turn in terms of resourcing the project. But it's, look, it's one, one. one definitely to just yeah reach out to Jerry, Victor, and, and others in uh, for more detail, right? We, we can't do yeah. just this on this call. So look, I have another five questions in my armory uh, that need answering, but only about two minutes. So what I want to do <laughs> is, if you are one of those people that have asked the question and it hasn't been answered, um, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question, then essentially you get priority. Sorry about Hi, Jerry. Hi, yes. yes, so um, I asked a question. Um, there's been a gray area. Eliminate dependencies or manage them. Sorry, say that again. Eliminate <laughs> dependencies <laughs> or manage dependencies. You can't eliminate dependencies. Dependencies are dependencies. If Absolutely. A is dependent on B, it's always yeah. going to be dependent on B. Unless you change B. To something it can't depend on, depend <laughs> upon. In which case, A is no longer valid. You can't eliminate dependencies. You have to manage them. I think that's a utopic, Jerry. Remind. Uh, it, it's just yeah. so interesting. That's a utopic envir um, uh, environment. If I if I can eliminate dependencies and make life easier, that'll be that's just heaven, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, unfortunately, the dependencies are there because of the very nature of what we're building. Yeah. Let me see if I can put one more in there, okay? One more question. Um, so can a project initially have a three-week sprint cycle and later move to a two-week uh, cycle as the length of features to be delivered comes down subsequently? And I guess, yeah, can it basically yeah. change? Why not? That's the answer. Why not? Yeah. Be pragmatic. Do what it takes. Yeah. Don't be prescriptive about this. You know, yeah. a sprint cycle is a sprint cycle. Yeah. It's what you do within the spring cycle that's the key, not the length of the cycle. Thanks, Jerry. And sure. if, if it only takes you two weeks to, to deliver that particular item, that particular set of items, then do it in two weeks. If it's going to take you three weeks, then do it in three weeks. Okay. So thank you. Sorry if we didn't get a chance to ask your, answer your question, but it's always good to leave the audience wanting more. So on that note, uh, Jerry, Victor, Ian, others who contributed, you did an amazing job. I'm sure it was well appreciated by everyone. So thank you for that. Um, 
And so for the rest of you, thank you for joining. Uh, you will receive an email from me. Join the Slack channel, join the YouTube channel, LinkedIn mentoring channel. And as you know, we have many more sessions taking place uh, tomorrow, rest of this week and next week. So I hope to see you on some of those. Thank you all.